Now, Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse number 1, the scripture says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah, to a lot of Jews, they don't even know it exists. And the reason they don't is because the rabbis, uh, they don't like the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. So what they try to do is to make it uh, talking about the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40. They say the servant of the Lord is Israel. And so therefore this is Israel in Isaiah chapter number 53. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a person in Isaiah 53, and this is a perspective that you're gonna get from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah that is looking upon the promise of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, and why he went to the cross and he suffered. It's important to understand that. Look at verse number three. The Bible says he is despised and rejected of men. Look at verse number four. He says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him the smitten of God and afflicted. So therefore he bore our sins. The Bible said that made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now these are strong statements, powerful statements, because it bears upon every human being that has ever lived or ever will live upon this earth. For the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse number five, the Bible said, he was wounded for our transgressions. This is what's called a vicarious suffering. He didn't suffer for himself, he suffered for you. And then in verse number six, the Bible said, God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Imagine that. Imagine God allowing sin to come into the universe to begin with, and then when it all came in, he laid it on his son. God's making a statement that we need to try to understand. In verse number 10, the Bible said he'll make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then the Bible said they laid his body in the tomb. But he said in the book of Acts chapter number two, thou wilt not suffer thine holy one, his soul to remain in hell. So we have the triunity of the Godhead all bound up in one person. Spirit goes to heaven, body laid in the tomb, and his soul descended into the lower parts of the earth. The process of descending started upon the cross because it is there that he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so he saw the travail of his soul. Therefore, to the Almighty, the suffering of the physical flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed a terrible, horrible thing because it was through that physical suffering that he offered his blood as a sacrifice for our sins. And when you take the blood out of the Bible, you rob it, you gut it of the power of God to save and cleanse the sinner. But my dear friend, God could look further than the flesh. As the people that stood by, they could see the flesh, but the Lord God Almighty can look into the soul. He's the only one that can read the soul. He can read it completely. And the Bible said he saw the travail of his soul. So therefore, this is a very, very sacred thing to think about God looking upon the soul of his son. So the Bible teaches us that in Isaiah chapter number 53, we have statements about this to understand, to get a perspective. Now look at the book of Psalm chapter number 22. And what you have in the Psalm chapter number 22 are the actual feelings of the one being crucified. This is what he felt while he was hanging upon that tree. This is what went on inside his soul at the cross. In Isaiah, in Psalm chapter number 22 and verse one, he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We read in the New Testament where he cried these very words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they thought he was crying out to Jeremiah or Isaiah, one of the prophets. He was crying out to the almighty, eternal, everlasting, absolute being, God Almighty. And he cried and said, God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, he did it for purpose. He did it for effect. No, he felt it. Everything he said is not an act. It's not a put on. It is the actual experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter number 22 and verse number six of the book of Psalm, it says this, but I am a worm 
and no man, the reproach of men, the despised of the people. You look at that, you think, my goodness, what could possibly have been going on inside his soul? Because my dear friend, the Bible said he was the very image of God. He came to restore the image of God. He was the only one that ever walked the face of this earth, was the very image of God in whom dwelled the fullness of the Godhead. And yet here at the cross, he had been re- he had been reduced to a worm. Are you getting this? In Psalm 22, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. And verse 16, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. So there at the cross, my friend, all the gods that he judged in Egypt. Do you remember the night of the Passover? When he came through Egypt and he said, I will judge the gods of the Egyptians. That's what he said. And when he came through and judged all the gods of the Egyptians, my friend made them understand his power and his authority over them. He did it as almighty God. These gods got mad. These are demons. The Bible said when the Gentiles offer a sacrifice, they offer it to devils. I don't care what you carve out, what you make of it, how you do it. It's still a devil. It's a demon. And so they saw their opportunity and they gathered around him. They came upon him. All the demonic forces of hell that could be poured out upon the Son of God came against him at the cross. Now God the Father has abandoned him. The demonic hordes of hell have come against him. His flesh is burning from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's hurting in every part of his body and his soul is seeing travail like it never has before. You begin to get a subtle picture of what's going on on the cross at Calvary when the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for us. In verse number 17 it says in Psalm 22, I may tell all my bones. Tell means count. He said, I may count all my bones. They look and stare upon me. So there is nothing of his essence that was held back. I follow him. Everything of his essence was given at the cross at Calvary. Everything he could possibly give was given at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, which makes his cross so much different from any other cross. A church, I warn you, I warn you, I warn you, any church that will not preach the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is not worth your time to walk through the door, for there is no power in that place. Amen. And then in verse number 14, he says in in Psalm 22, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. And so what you get in Isaiah, I mean in Psalm 22, is how he felt. This is what was going on inside him while he was hanging up on the tree. In Isaiah chapter number 55, this is that perspective about the application of this as you find it in the Old Testament. Then when you come to the New Testament, one of the apostles of all the apostles was the interpreter of Christ. A.T. Robertson said this to you, and I've said it to you before. He wrote a book. He said, Paul is the interpreter of Christ. In plain words, he gives you the full theological perspective of what the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ was all about. The actual event is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is the historical, actual event of the crucifixion. But when the Apostle Paul wrote the New Testament, he began to develop the doctrine of the cross. He began to show us what's going on. For example, in Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 16, the Apostle said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to every one that believeth to the Jew first and all sort of the Greek power. There is power in the cross. If you've tried religion and you may try self-help, you may try to, uh, uh, my, some, uh, some counseling with some religious, but my dear friend, let me tell you something. There's no power in it, but there is power. There is still power. There is great power in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take hold of that cross and it'll change your life forever. The apostle Paul applies the cross. First of all, he said there's the power of God. Then he said it is a place of separation. In Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself for me. You can tell when the cross has affected your life. You can tell when you've been to the cross. There is a separation that takes place between you and religion. In Romans chapter number 6, the apostle said, knowing this, that our old man, do you get this? Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. 
So therefore, there is a separation that takes place at the cross. My dear friend, it will separate you. And I make no mistake about it, it still does. It's not a historical event that you're concerned about. It is what actually exists at this very moment is the preaching of the Word of God. The words that I'm preaching to you right now, the message that I'm giving you right now is full of life. If you'll accept that life, you can receive it today and you can be born of the Spirit of God. The third thing is the spiritual warfare that took place. Look at Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 15. This is what happened at the cross. The Bible said, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's a remarkable thing. When you study that verse a little bit, you'll find out they say it is one of the most controversial uh, scriptures in the whole New Testament. Anytime you find that, dig in. Anytime you find it where they say it is very controversial, spend some time there. Dig into it because you're going to get a truth out of there. You see, the problem is that men still twist the scriptures to their own destruction. But when the Bible says plainly that he made a show of them openly, he triumphed over them in it. He says right here in the book of Colossians chapter number two, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly and triumphed over them in it. That word spoiled, it literally means strip them, disarm them, take away their power. At the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ in his weakness died, but in his weakness, when he died, he became the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He was there, the eternal sacrifice for all of mankind, and by being that, he stripped the demonic powers that try to take your life and fool you and drag you down. Let me tell you something, Christian. If you're born again by the Spirit of God this morning, you've been washed in the blood, you've been sealed by the Holy Ghost, you're a child of God by the new birth, and you have within you He that is greater than He that is in this world. Yes! That is your inheritance. That is your heritage. And so the Bible said, He made a show of them openly. One of the reasons I suppose that they may say that it's controversial is because of the power that's given to the believer. Some churches like to lord over you and make you work in their church and make you work for their church, make you work from their church and they wave their hand over your head and say, all right, you're okay now, you can go to heaven. No, let me tell you what will get you to heaven. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. The wrath of God abideth on him. The fourth thing we find at the cross is forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah to God. In Luke chapter number 23 and verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Forgive them, Father. That's my Savior. That's my Lord. Slow to anger, long suffering to usward, would not have any to come into condemnation, but tasted death for every man. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I can't imagine how they felt standing there that day. I can't imagine when they heard him say that. I can't imagine what went through their soul when they heard the one they had nailed unjustly to a cross say, Father, forgive my killers, forgive my murderers, forgive them. And so the Bible teaches us that there at the cross there is forgiveness of sin. The Bible said God could be just and the justifier of them that believeth on Jesus. He's a holy, righteous, almighty being and he cannot sin. He's a holy, righteous, almighty being and he cannot look upon sin. But therefore he must be just in dealing with sin. And so therefore to condemn sin, God is just because he's holy, holy, holy. But how's he gonna save a sinner? How's he gonna save the lost? Because we're sinners. Therefore in Christ Jesus our Lord, he took our place, paid our price, became what we are. And therefore God in Christ reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, and committed to us the word, the message of reconciliation. God therefore retained his justness, but then he justified the sinner. Because in Christ Jesus, it's as if you had never sinned. You've been in a court of law. The prosecutor's brought his charges against you. Your defense attorney is the Holy Spirit of God. And you have been found innocent of all the charges brought against you. You can walk out of that place. They take the shackles off of your hand and they can never bring you back in there again. No double jeopardy in the salvation of God. Finished. Then the fifth thing that we find on the cross, this is a beautiful one, John 19, verse 30. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Religion never is finished. Good works are never finished. There are some things that never cease. They'll wear you out for the rest of your life. He'll wear you out in your emotions, in your mind, your soul, your spirit. He'll wear you out. Why? Because he does not want you to have the rest 
of Christ. The book of Hebrews talks about the rest in Christ. It talks about being able to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've committed to him my spirit, my soul. I know him, he knows me. I'm, I'm not perfect. I may come short of the glory of God, and I know I will. And my friend, let me tell you something. It's not that that justifies you before God. It is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look carefully. It is finished, he said. What does that mean? That means that the master builder has now consummated, completed what he intended to start. And that was at the cross. There's no other cross. There's no other need for a cross. It was there that God brought the sinner. At the cross, he took the sinner. He condemned the sinner. And by condemning the sinner, the sinner has no hope. And yet Christ was that one. And he was there to finish salvation, to tell us die. Listen carefully. The master builder in the book of Genesis 49, verse number 24, here's what Jacob said. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. We'll go all the way back thousands of years to hear Jacob say that the stone is the stone of Israel. And it is the God of Jacob, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. It's the God of Jacob. What's that mean? It is the God that dealt directly, personally with Jacob to bring him where he was at that point. He didn't change with Abraham and Isaac, but he's talking about my God. <laughs> How many of you today have your God? My God, you can't take my God from me. You could steal the teraphim. You remember what Laban said? He woke up one day and he hunted for his gods and couldn't find them. I'd hate to be in shape like that. The caravan had already left. It was gone. And Rebecca had taken his gods and she had carried them away and she'd hidden them. My, what a sad thing. He catches up with him and says, where's my gods? What have you done with my gods? Isn't that sad? You can't steal my God. You can't take him away. You can't even hide him. You have no control over him. He's almighty God. Amen. And so the stone, it was the sure foundation that was laid. That's the master builder. He laid that foundation. It is called a tried stone. Yes, it was tried when he was here 2,000 years ago in every way that you could be tried. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. It is the rejected stone, the Bible says, the stone which the builders rejected has become in the marvelous sight of God. Then he is the stone that is cut out of a mountain. Being cut out of a mountain, that stone smites this big image, this times of the Gentiles on its feet, and it comes crashing down. You live in a world right now that if the wrong button is pushed, everything that you've ever known about life is going to change instantly. Can you imagine that? And so he is the precious cornerstone. Look at how the stone is taken and the foundation is laid. And then finally, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. The stone comes back and he smites this image. Even so, come Lord Jesus, smite that thing out there and bring it down to its knee. Destroy what man has built and let God come and set up his kingdom, amen, which will be an everlasting kingdom, pure and holy, even that. So the finished work of the master builder is salvation. So what about the master builder who built your salvation, my dear friend, at the cross at Calvary? He will declare it finished and this, yes, he declared it's finished and this is personal with me. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I believe in the cross, but I thank God for the gospel, but no, get the butt out of there. It's finished. Number six thing I see at the cross reveals the true nature of man. Matthew 27 verse 18. The scripture says this, for envy they delivered him. And he knew it was for envy that they delivered him. In other words, in other, in other words some Mickey Mouse junk garbage purpose, they delivered up the Lord Jesus Christ to be crucified on a cross. Men are doing it right now. They're killing babies over there in Ukraine right now. And don't you think it's an amazing thing, folks? You are witnessing World War II. This is how it happened in World War II. Germany went into Poland and they slaughtered. Then they went into Russia and for a while they slaughtered everything in their sight. This is what they do. They kill each other. You're watching a modern city, a modern country being brought down and destroyed before your very eyes. That's what World War II is about. Bombing civilians, bombing cities. Wake up, folks. You've never seen that in your lifetime. It reveals the true nature of man. But last of all, let me tell you something the cross reveals. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Reveals the love of God.
The other day, two boys, 16 years old, took a ball bat. They took their, their Spanish teacher and beat her to death with a ball bat. In school, school kids beat this poor old soul to death. Did you know that when I was in rural high school, going to a secular school, I learned something? Let me tell you what I learned. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I didn't learn, I didn't learn that at home. I didn't learn it in Sunday school. I learned it in the public school system. We've come a long way, baby. If you don't believe that God loves you, look at Calvary. If you don't believe God's got a purpose in you being here, look at Calvary. If you don't believe your sins have been forgiven and taken care of, look at Calvary. That's a love letter from God, but it's also a dagger in the heart of Satan. It is where he was defeated, and it is where we're saved. Have you been to Calvary? Somebody wrote a song. I thought the words were good. Listen to this. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. It is grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea. Though millions have found in him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. The hand of my Savior is strong and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room Take you out and put your name in there. There's room at the cross. There's room at the cross for Charles, Susan, Johnny. Makes no difference who you are. Janice, there's room at the cross for you. You mean God would save me, preacher? You don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you did. It doesn't make any difference what I know about you. It's what God said. Come unto me. Father, bless your word. I've given them what you laid on my soul. Father, I cannot do what the Holy Spirit can do this morning. If there's somebody in this house today that they don't know you, Lord, they don't know you. They've been around religion. They've even prayed. They've been to Sunday school, been revival meetings, gone to church. But in their heart and in their soul, they still know they don't know you. I pray they'd find that room at the cross. The foot of the cross is as level as it comes. Red, yellow, black, and white. Rich, poor, bond, and free. Let them come to the Lord Jesus. In your holy name I pray.